Hey everyone, sorry for the delay. We were having some technical difficulties, but we got them figured out. So welcome to LumCon's Thursday Science Talk. Usually I start these talks with some really bad jokes, but I turn that responsibility this week over to Craig. Yay! <laughs> I'm so excited. All right. You, are you ready, Mert? And are you ready, Bing Jin? Okay, so I, these are for both of you. So why don't ants get COVID? Uh, I have no idea. Big Chin? <laughs> That's a good question. Because of their little antsy bodies. <laughs> okay, that's a good job. <laughs> oh, that one was a hit. <laughs> okay, my my next joke, and again, I'm not as professional as Mertz, so my uh, jokes don't always are not coinciding with the talk topic tonight. Um, but so uh, the next one's had me giggling for the entire week, so I'm gonna tell this one as well. Um, so, how many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Oh, it seems I've heard this one before. <laughs> Either um, of you? Chandler says 10. That's right, it takes 10 tickles. <laughs> <laughs> Chandler. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we have says his officially are worse than yours. <laughs> and I won. <laughs> and since tonight's topic is remote sensing, you know, the joke should have been related to satellites, but I don't tell satellite jokes because they're over <laughs> my head and they never land. Oh, no. No. <laughs> searching for these horrible jokes. <laughs> the audience is loving. I got to take a minute to read some of these. So we have said his is officially worse than yours. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is this Aaron? worse better or <laughs> or just worse? <laughs> Aaron says, Craig, you have been topped. Um, Peter says my computer screen just cracked. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are amazing. I love our audience. With that, I'm going to get out of here before <laughs> things get worse. <laughs> I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Thank you, Mert. Well, good evening again, and I hope I find you and your family and friends safe and in good health this evening. I'm Craig McClain, the Executive Director of the Louisiana University's Brain Consortium, and I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight for LumCon's online science series. So every other Thursday night now at 7 p.m. Central, we're inviting a Louisiana scientist to share their research, and we'll give you the opportunity to listen and to ask questions of some truly amazing people doing some truly extraordinary science. And I hope you will continue to join us each and every week as we explore the more of the world from the comfort of our homes. And you can find information about the complete series, including our next uh, set of speakers, which we have scheduled throughout the rest of the fall. Um, just go to our website, lumpon.edu. Just scroll down on our homepage, and you'll see a link there under the news and content and events. So tonight, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Bing Chin Liu. Uh, Dr. Liu brings her experience in oceanography and coastal science to the Water Institute. Um, her research dabbles in wetland estuary biogeochemistry and ocean color remote sensing. Uh, she has extensive research experience in monitoring and characterizing river coastal dynamics, including land ocean interactions, carbon cycling, phytoplankton community dynamics, and water quality in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so her research is quite expansive. Um, her current research focuses on water quality modeling 
and remote sensing monitoring to examine the responses of aquatic ecosystems to both meteorological and climatic changes and anthropogenic activities from restoration efforts in Louisiana's coastal zone. And her research activities include model improvements and validations, development of solid light algorithms, field work and laboratory experiments of phytoplankton community dynamics um, in the estuary coastal zones of Louisiana. And so in addition to being a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute, uh, Dr. Liu is also the deputy director for the Restore Act Center of Excellence um, here in Louisiana, and uh, where she helps to the administration of a competitive coastal research grants program. And so Dr. Liu, so excited to have you here tonight um, and excited to hear about your research. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Craig, for your introduction. And thank you, everyone, for your time being here for my talk. I'm so glad to give my presentation for Long Kong Science Talk. And today, the topic of my presentation is remote sensing application in monitoring coastal water quality. There are four subtopics that I want to discuss more, is that uh, the light and water, what's the relationship between them, and how the light penetrates the water column and finally get back to remote sensing satellite sensor. And second, I want to talk about what's the major uh, constituents in water that affect the color of water. Next, I will introduce you some fundamentals of remote sensing for aquatic environment. And in the last section, I will talk about the satellite products of water quality. And I will also show you some very important website for satellite data in case you are interested in, uh, you are in search, interested in using it for your research. Okay, I'll begin my presentation with a very simple question. Have you ever think about why we have such colorful world? Have you ever imagined that if we live in a world that without light, then we cannot see anything, we cannot see any color. So when we describing color, the basis is light. The light can interact with the objects around us and the light can be finally reflected to our eyes and then finally we can detect the different things and different colors this is the same concept for satellite sensor the sunlight illuminates the earth surface and reflected by our earth surface and finally transmitted through the atmosphere and finally reach the satellite sensor so satellite sensor see our earth in this way that's why it can provide us some colorful imagery. Um, before I talk about remote sensing, I want to talk more about our sunlight because it's very important. It illum illuminates our Earth's surface. Uh, in optics, we call sunlight is electromagnetic spectrum. So we use wavelengths to describe the color of light. Um, from shortest wavelengths, it's X-rays to visible spectrum to radio waves. There are small part of spectrum that can detect by, by our human eyes. We call it visible light. We use wavelengths to define the color of light. For example, 440 is for blue color, 550 is for green color, and 650 for red color. So, um, have you ever think about why different objects have different colors? Because they have different optical properties. They can absorb some colors and scatter some other colors that has not been absorbed. For example, when the white light shoot on this red shirt, the dye in the fabric allow this shirt absorb all the colors except the red. So only red color has been left to reflect it to our eyes. So we define this shirt in red color. This concept is similar as what we see, the colors of our water. You may have a feeling that in open ocean, the water seems in dark blue. When you move from open ocean to coastal zones and to estuaries to inland waters, you will see the water becomes more and more turbid, and uh, the color of water becomes greenish or brownish. 
That's because of different constituents in the water dominate the color of water. In open ocean, water molecule itself can absorb and scatter the light. It dominates the color of open ocean. But back to coastal and estuaries, coastal waters and estuaries. There are high concentrations of dissolved organic matters, sediment, and phytoplankton in the waters. They both can absorb and scatter light differently and modulate the water color. Also, these three components are very important indicators of water quality. So let's dig into details to see why our ocean is in dark blue color. As light travels through the clear oceanic water, here we define the clear as um, the oceanic water uh, full of water molecules with less amount of sediment, phytoplankton, and color dissolved organic, organic matter there. So the absorption of light mainly dominated by water molecules. This is absorption spectrum of water molecules. You will see there's uh, right light is strongly absorbed by water molecules. And further, the light can also be scattered in multiple directions by water molecules. From this diagram, you will see blue light is strongly uh, and efficiently scattered by water molecules compared to red light. So here's a cartoon show you in deeper ocean. Um, the red light, yellow light, and the green light has been completely absorbed by water molecules. Only blue light and the violet color has been left. So this amount of blue color has been scattered back to our eyes. That's why our deep ocean water is in dark blue because red color has been absorbed and the blue color are scattered to our eyes. I make a, a funny cartoon here. Uh, I don't know, have you ever had this um, type of experience when you are diving in shallow waters with colorful stuff? You will still see colorful, you will still see many different colors because in shallow waters, all the wavelengths of light are available here. So for example, this red apple, it can absorb all colors flat except the red color. So the red color has been left to reflect it to our eyes. So in shallow water, red apple is a red apple. But if you dive into deeper ocean, the, um, the other colors light, like red, yellow, and green color, they has been fully absorbed. Only blue and green light left in deeper ocean. But based on the optical properties of an apple, it can absorb all colors except red. So at this time, it still absorbs blue and green light, but no red light to reflect to our eyes. So it showed in dark color. Um, that's why our open ocean showed in dark blue color. Let's back to our coastal, uh, coastal zones. Let's say the Asian coastal waters. It's far more complex compared to open ocean because coastal zone is one of the most biogeochemically active zone in our world. It's uh, influenced by both natural and anthropogenic processes. For example, it receives lots of um, nutrients from river and groundwater. It will cause the eutrophication and algal bloom and hypoxia events here. And also it is frequently influenced by coastal storms, bring very strong precipitation, storm surge and flooding events. Also, our coastal zone is influenced by coastal development and uh, it has huge land use variations like in our, our coastal Louisiana. So both of these natural and anthropogenic processes, it will include, um, it will increase the terrestrial input of dissolved and the particulate matters. And these um, constituents in the water will cause optically complex water in coastal waters, like we can frequently absorb uh, algal bloom and the turbid water. So this is a very uh, good example. It is, it is an RGB image from Modis to show you diverse color in different water types. 
and show you how optically complex in the northern Gulf of Mexico. You will see in most of the estuaries here, uh, like in Beretari Basin, in uh, Abalachicola Bay, and uh, some other estuaries, you will see very dark color. That because of the dissolved organic matter, it is a very strong absorber, but they uh, don't get a light. And in contrast, you will see the bright brownish color around the Mississippi Delta and in Atchafalaya Basin. That because of very high concentrations of sediment here, sediment can strongly scatter the light to our to our eyes. That why that's why you will see the bright color here, and you will see different colors caused by algae bloom. That because of different pigments and a different shape and uh, um, and the size of phytoplankton cause the different um, optical um, phenomenon of this water. All of these um, three components are major constituents that dominate the water color in coastal zones. They have different absorption and backscattering properties. And further, <clears throat> both the absorption and the backscattering, they will further determine how much light can live in the sea surface, like the AW, AC down, NAP, and AFA. This, these are absorption from phytoplankton, sediment, color dissolved organic matter, and water. And they also backscatter water. And further, they determine how much light leaving the sea surface and detected by the satellites. The most um, important, one of the most important parameters we use for aquatic environment to study water quality is called the remote sensing reflectance. It is here and here. It is a direct indicator of ocean color, of the water color. It can be linked to back scattering and absorption in this way. This is simplified version of uh, radi radiative transfer equation. And uh, zoom in that uh, satellite RGB image in last slides, we will see different types of water. I can show you different types of remote sensing reflectance spectrum from, um, from field data. And actually from satellite data, we can also uh, get this type of spectrum, but um, the spectral resolution is lower than this one. This is a hyperspectral. Uh, reflectance, uh, reflectance spectrum. The background of this figure is the color of water what we see from our eyes, and this is the color what we see from satellite sensors. And uh, move a little bit southward, and uh, this type of water, water is dominated by both sediment and uh, algae, the phytoplankton. You will see it become a little bit more greenish. So its spectrum changed in this shape, and its reflectance peak moved from um, orange yellow color to uh, greenish color. Let's go to algae bloom type of water. You will see um, the green water, and you will see the spectrum in this shape. It has reflectance peak around 500 meter. That is green color. And uh, let's move to the edge of the algae bloom area and the less phytoplankton in this area compared to here. You will see the spectrum uh, have more reflectance um, in blue color because of water molecules. Finally, we move to clear water. You will see strong reflectance of blue color. So I think this uh, reflectance spectrum explain you why different water types showed you different colors. So um, back to this slice, uh, we can obtain this type of data from satellite uh, remote sensing data. And with this data, we need to do a lot of field work to develop satellite algorithm to derive some water quality parameters. Also, we need to use field data to validate the results predicted from satellite data. And we usually collected water samples 
Um, we filter the water samples on both immediately, and this is the filtration setup. Uh, we use this type of filter to block the constituents in water, so we can further measure the concentrations of different parameters like SPM, it is sediment, and dissolved organic carbon, it's DOC, and the particulate organic carbon. And HPLC, it mainly for different pigments for phytoplankton. And we can also use some optics instrument to measure the absorption, backspectering, and fluorescence from field to deploy this instrument in water. And we also have a radiometer to measure the remote sensing reflectance at the sea surface. This uh, instrument is used to calibrate the satellite data. Well, uh, next, I will, did a over, I will do an overview of NASA satellite sensors for water quality monitoring. Um, this figure is from NASA website. You will see lots of um, uh, running uh, satellites from NASA. And I marked out uh, four satellites, which is very popular for water quality study. They are Landsat, uh, S SMPP, Terra, and Aqua. Currently, se uh, several satellites observe water surface properties in open ocean, like Aqua Modis. It has one kilometer by, by one kilometer spatial resolution. Mm, we can get if uh, if given a location, we can get one image for this location on two, one to two days. And in coastal ocean and estuaries, this spatial resolution of MODIS is still okay for coastal waters. And we also have another sensor called MPP VIRS. It's in 750 uh, meter spatial resolution, and we can get this image uh, one image one day at a given location. And move to inland lakes and uh, some small estuaries, small water bodies. I think the one kilometer by one kilometer spatial resolution is not enough to study these smaller water bodies. But we have some other satellites, they have very higher spatial resolution, like Landsat is a very good example. It has 30 meter by 30 meter resolution. However, it is um it's um, it, uh, it it circles very long it takes six games to uh, map the whole earth and that means you will get one image for, for a given location every 16 days so they both have advantage and disadvantages if you want very high spatial resolution so you cannot have a uh, very high temporal resolution because um um, if you keep both resolution very high, it can be require large space to save the data. Mm. And currently, a number of water quality parameters are optionally available from these satellites, like temperature and chlorophyll at global scale. Uh, in next few slides, I will introduce you some of my research how I extract the water quality parameters like phytoplankton, like sediment and color dissolved organic matters from satellite data. And the first um, component I want to introduce is phytoplankton. Uh, let me introduce what is phytoplankton first. It is a basis of food web. Uh, it can do photosynthesis and provide organic, uh, organic matter uh, in the um, transfers organic matter through the food web. They have different shapes and different size and different colors. You will see how different their shape and the size are. And they also contain different pigments in their cells like chlorophylls, um, carotenoids, and the phacoblins. For these different pig pigments, they have different absorption spectrum that results in different colors of different phytoplankton group. For some of the pigments, they are, they are only specific to one group, like chlorophyll B here is for chlorophyte. Pyridinine is for dinoflagellate. This one is for cyanobacteria. So 
because of different pigments and different shape and different size, the phytoplankton they can absorb and backscatter light differently, make them in different color, and the photo and then satellite data can detect them. So we definitely can extract the information of phytoplankton abundance, taxonomy, and the size from satellite data. Well, this is a standard chlorophyll products I download from NASA website. It is chlorophyll A concentration in spring 2014. Um, yeah, you will see in open ocean, the chlorophyll A is very low, but in coastal area, you will see the red colors and the yellowish color. That means very high concentrations of chlorophyll, especially in inland waters because of high nutrient availability here for phytoplankton growth. Um, it has been proved many times satellite chlorophyll A products, it performs very well in open ocean. However, it generally filled in estuarine coastal waters. Let's zoom in this area. This is a standard product from the um, from NASA's website. Um, you will see this type of distribution and concentration. Um, the bottom panel is chlorophyll products generated from our uh, chlorophyll uh, algorithms, algorithms. You will see the distribution patterns in open ocean. Oh, something happened. Uh, I'm sorry, can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can. Oh, it's just frozen. I cannot um, change to next slides, um, but let's wait for a minute. Let me continue with these slides. You will see um, it's very distribution patterns with uh, with the chlorophyll products from our algorithms, and we use field data to validate chlorophyll A products from standard NASA chlorophyll products and our products. It will showed it showed much more improvement for our algorithm. Mm, still frozen. Um, can you can you ex can you close PowerPoint and just reopen it, maybe? I just cannot find where's my mouse. Can you see the <laughs> mouse moving around? No, we can't. Oh, it's so weird. Oh, I just oh, use my <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry for that. Um. So this is chlorophyll A map because each phytoplankton group, they all contain chlorophyll A. So it is a very good indicator um, to show the phytoplankton biomass and abundance. Is there any other reason that we care about the phytoplankton abundance? That is phytoplankton bloom. We also call it uh, algae bloom. It can be very harmful to our health and uh, marine animals. You will see um, this, no, they're not beautiful, they're algae bloom. Um, they can, the algae bloom, they can in different colors. It can be in reddish color, um, that's caught by uh, red tide. The dominant species uh, groups are dinoflagellate. You can also see the blue, green colors dominated by cyanobacteria, and the brown tide dominated by diatom. Phytoplankton bloom typically occurred with a very high concentrations of a specific species. So for this species, it must have one cell size and a specific um, biomarker pigments. So with that, it should have very unique absorption and backscattering properties. With this information, satellite ocean color data, it can tell us what is the dominant species of this algal bloom? That's very important information. So if we know what species dominate there, we will know whether it's toxic or not. How much, how, how large the scale will be of this algal bloom? 
Next, I will show you some satellite products um, from my research to detect what species dominate this large-scale uh, uh, large algal bloom. This is a case study for Hurricane Mako. Uh, Hurricane Mako made landfall on October 10th, um, 2018, um, around Ach uh, Apalachicola Bay. This is uh, the first, I'm sorry, I cannot find my mouse. So uh, the satellite imagery obtained on October 6th, just uh, by this hurricane track map, you will not see anything relevant to algal bloom. But one day after hurricane landfall, you will see milky blue green color appeared adjacent to the shelf water, uh, uh, the shelf water in adjacent to Apalachicola Bay. And later on October 12th, you will see another different color. It's something like brownish or red, reddish color appeared and um, we are curious about what species dominate there. It seems there's two species have synchronous bloom. So we use remote sensing technique to map the phytoplankton pigment ratios. Finally, we figure out what species are there. It's a synchronous, uh, synchronous bloom event of two species. One species, uh, which is in milky blue green, is a coccolithophore species species is called Emilianea Huxley. And the next species showed brownish and reddish color. It is, it is a reddish, uh, it is a red tide species, very famous. It is Crania brevis. It is very famous along the Florida coast. It occurred very frequently. And this is the first time to report um, the synchronous bloom of these two species from satellite data in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So our satellite algorithm showed that um, it can detect the bloom species during an algal bloom event. That is very important for um, the forecast. Um, we can do time series of pigment um, map to show what pigment there, and uh, we will monitor the development of algal bloom based on the pigment maps. And next, uh, still relevant to phytoplankton, we also care about its size. Why? Because it is very important. Phytoplankton can be divided into three categories. Pico phytoplankton, they are very small, between 0.2 to 2 micron uh, meters and the uh, nano phytoplankton and the macro phytoplankton they are they can shape the structure of marine food web um you will see the smaller the phytoplankton is the longer the food web is and uh, the higher the diversity of the food web is and the phytoplankton also is a major thing that transferred um carbon from surface ocean to deep ocean if it uh, if it, the size is large, it will transform more carbon from surface ocean to deep ocean. Here's the product for phytoplankton size distributions. The first column is for macro phytoplankton, and the second column is for nano phytoplankton, and the third column is for pico phytoplankton, and different rows for different seasons. You will see they distributed very differently. Macro phytoplankton in uh, asteroids, nano phytoplankton in mid shelves, and the pico phytoplankton in offshore waters. Um, I also have done some work related to carbon. We use satellite data to map the distributions of different types of carbon in coastal Louisiana. Um, you will see this is the distributions of sediment uh, in Barrytary Basin and in Archipelago Basin. It's very contrasting. Um, because in Barrytary Basin, there is no source of sediment. It's not connected to the rivers. That's why they have river, um, they have diversion project there. They want to deliver more sediment here to protect and restore the wetland in Barrytary Basin. In contrast, the Chapalaya Basin is totally influenced by the sediment plume. You will see very turbid water there. And this is dissolved organic carbon. Um, it's different with sediment 
Delta, they showed very high concentration of dissolved organic matter because um, the, set, the white land is a potential source of dissolved organic carbon. Uh, you will see a Chavalaya basin, the DOC is not that high, um, and the river is not a major source of dissolved organic carbon from this map. This is an ongoing research we haven't published it. Um, definitely deserve to um, more study on that. And the remote sensing is powerful. We also generate time series um, BOC product in Baratar Basin. And uh, from 1985 to 2012, you will see there are two. Uh, one is in 1992, another one is in 2005. It showed very high concentrations of DOC. I will leave this question for you. Um, maybe you can think about what coastal events caught, caused these higher concentrations of DOC. In addition to aquatic environment, remote sensing is awesome. It can be also applied to landscape classification, land use um, variation studies. Um, this is some product from our research. It showed uh, landscape variations in Baratar Basin. You will see the increase of developed area for uh, urban area and agriculture and a decrease in salt marsh, which is in brown color. And uh, here I will show you some useful website for uh, satellite data. This is a, um, uh, the website I use very frequently. It's NASA Ocean Color website. I download all the ocean color data. And from here, it can be one day, one month, one week. Um, and they also provide useful processing tools. It called CDAS. Uh, it's very useful. Uh, it's very user-friendly software and uh, with detailed instructions on this website. And uh, for that time series DOC and the uh, land use variations, I use Landsat data. I download from um, UICS Earth Explorer website. It provides all of the Landsat data here from Landsat 1 to 8. And the next web page is a um, very user friendly website. It provides you different. Um, um, it provides you a bunch of images for different products like precipitation, chlorophyll, temperature, salinity. And you can just uh, click around to see what happened around you and what happened uh, in the world for different days, different months, different years. That's super awesome. Um, I think that's pretty much about my talk. Um, next, welcome to any questions from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have a couple of answers to your question about the um, the differences in the DOC. Yeah, this time, time series. series. DOC. Mm -hmm. So we have several people saying um, hurricane. Yeah, it's hurricane. Uh, in 1992, it's Hurricane Angel. Um, it's a very um, powerful um, hurricane that um, happened around the Mississippi Delta in Baratar Basin. Another one, I think everyone knows, Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005. Um, because of the very strong wind, it will uh, stir up the bottom DOC because the water is very shallow in this bay. So it will strongly increase the concentrations of DOC in surface water. Also, it will um, broke a lot of vegetations. They died and they excrete DOC in the water. And also the strong wind and the strong precipitation will flush out those uh, DOC to the adjacent water bodies. Those combined effects make very high concentrations uh, of DOC in this barrier bay. Perfect. Arturo has a question about um, climate change, and he is interested in knowing with the rapidly changing climate, has there been a change in community composition of regular algal blooms? 
Uh, yes, uh, actually I did several case study about hurricane oh. effects on phytoplankton community um, dynamics. For this hurricane, you know, it moves very fast. It doesn't, uh, it didn't bring very, very strong precipitation uh, because it can move fast. So it caused a very strong storm surge, just like Laura. And um, because of storm surge, it pushed salty water into the bay. And the physical process here is different with very strong precipitation and a, mo a slowly moving hurricane. It will, uh, for the slowly moving hurricane, it will increase the intensity of precipitation, the fresh water. It will um, increase the possibility of the bloom of freshwater species. And like for the hurricane Mako, it um, caused the algal bloom happened in shelf waters. Actually, the Crania brave is the right type species. They don't like fresh water. Why did it happen here? Because Cocolisopher happened first. And the Karenia brevis, they can take use of organic nutrient, which is different with other phytoplankton group. We guess um, the diet uh, Cocolisopher uh, excrete dissolved organic nutrient and further taken by Karenia brevis, and then it bloomed after Cocolisopher. So different um, hurricanes, they have different track they have different intensity. They will cause very different physical processes like precipitation, current, and so many different parameters are different. They will influence the phytoplankton community dynamics differently. Um, I think uh, we need to take specific case study to see how it influences the phytoplankton community dynamics. Will you be adding um... Will you be looking at the effects of Laura? I hope so. I already started to look at the satellite imagery of Laura before Laura and after Laura. There are lots of difference before and after the hurricane. Uh, I definitely uh, very interested in to look at the photoquantum dynamics using the existing satellite algorithm because they are already validated by a bunch of field data. They are robust. So I just generate the product to see what happened there. Great. Maya has a, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, um, but uh, she has a question about uh, ocean plastic and if the plastic in the ocean is causing there to be different differences in the color of the water or um, the detective properties of the water that you're looking at? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, ocean plastic now is a very hot topic for oceanography. No matter you are doing modeling, you are doing remote sensing, you are doing um, your focus is field work. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, the pl ocean plastic, it will in, uh, induce uh, different optical properties of uh, water. Um, currently, there are some uh, research already started to take field data, optics field data, to measure the spectrum of plastic and trying to link to remote sensing. But I haven't seen the satellite products relevant to ocean plastic, but this is a very good directional um, uh, study. Perfect. We have a question about um, how complicated the data from the coastal area can be. How do you uncomplicate the coastal area in the work that you do? Um, very, very good question. There's <laughs> lots of physics behind this question. Uh, you know, in coastal waters, it's very complex because so many different constituents here. And currently, lots of standard um, satellite products like for chlorophyll A, they work very well in open ocean because the water there is very simple. Um, so those algorithms, they're not suitable for coastal oceans because they use the 
on the wavelengths of satellite data suitable for open ocean. What we did, we select the suitable wavelengths for estuaries and coastal waters. But uh, like the product I show you here, it also have, have this advantage. It cannot uh, generate the global product. It only suitable for specific estuaries or coastal zones because different estuary coastal zones they have <laughs> they have different <laughs> optical properties. It's very hard to generate global products. Yeah, we just select uh, specific wavelengths suitable for estuarine coastal waters in our coastal zones based on so many field data. Great. Arturo's second question is, can satellite data images, um, can they measure pH of the ocean? They can, um, that's, uh, I don't know too much about pH, but I think uh, it can indirectly link it to pH because, you know, satellite data, they can map um, like salinity, temperature, and some other parameters, physical parameters. The you know pH, they have potential relationship between those parameters. And if you have product of satellite data, you can definitely link to pH based on the relationship between them. It's just a calculation of matrix calculations for satellite data. Great. Um, how big does a bloom need to be before you can actually detect it? Um, actually, we can detect it from the uh, initial scale because uh, I can show you here. Oops. Oops, here. For the bottom satellite data is 10 by 10 uh, meter resolution. It's actually it's very high resolution satellite data. It can observe very finer scale uh, oceanic phenomena. So we definitely can monitoring uh, the algal bloom at the very initial conditions because once it showed a little bit of high chlorophyll concentration, we know something happened here. Great. All right, audience, um, any more questions before we let Bing Ching get back to her little girls who are anxious <laughs> to see her? <laughs> yeah. We'll just give people a minute to type in case there are other questions. But while we're waiting for that. Yeah, um, thank you. Welcome, any questions? You can ask, you email so me much. your question. I'm happy yeah, to answer. We will, we will do that. If we get questions after the talk, mm -hmm. I'll certainly uh, pass those along. But thank you so much for giving an interesting talk. We have a lot of comments coming in saying it was a great talk. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Hey, Craig, are you still out there somewhere? No. Uh, so I get to answer Chandler's question myself. So uh, Chandler actually came in with a um, with a question about the LUMCON facilities during the hurricanes last week. <laughs> so um, we fared extremely well. And our hearts and our thoughts go out to um, those who were impacted drastically during uh, yeah. Hurricane Laura. So in comparison, we did extremely well. Um, mm. We had about a maximum flooding in, inside the downstairs ground level lobby of about three feet. It was probably mm -hmm. about four and a half, three, three to four and a half feet across the property. Um, mm -hmm. But we were extremely well prepared. Our shutters once again held and we had no significant damage. I mean, we had a couple boards come off the docks mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, but we were, we were very, very, very lucky comparatively. Um, so mm -hmm. again, our hearts and minds go out to the people who are, who are suffering the most at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary is asking, 
for you to show the websites where you get your data again? Yeah. Sure. Um, um, you can tap NASA Ocean Color. I think the first one could be this website. And uh, NASA Ocean Color, this is an awesome website. All of my PhD studies based on the data from this website. <laughs> great. Second, I have been, uh, I've been to that website. It is a great website. <laughs> There's yeah, a lot. There. Have, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. This is the second one. It's USGS Earth Explorer. And if you tap this, uh, this one, it also comes the first the website. Um, this one, I mainly use it for Landsat data. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. And uh, the last one, uh, it's just a, a very user-friendly uh, for you to go through different pic images, uh, different satellite products. You don't have to download data. You just need to click around to see what is happening. Mm -hmm. Um. A question came in, you're welcome, Mary. Um, a question came in about if someone is interested in doing the kinds of science that you're doing, where's a good place to start? Um, I think this is a good place to start because it has every single step to tell you um, about remote sensing data. What should you do this? What should you do that? I said it's awesome because the instructions is very detailed in this website. And also, um, yeah, there's lots of, uh, there are some training classes related to ocean color and uh, they provide you um, a fellowship. Uh, if you can apply, I, I think this is very important. I attend the NASA ocean color training course in 2017 that helped me very, uh, very much. I start my research after that summer class uh, at NASA. Um, so just uh, go through and uh, play around with NASA's website. You will get a lot of more information uh, relevant to remote sensing. Great. Any other questions out there, audience? We're still getting more comments about how wonderful your talk was. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> oh, it looks like we've answered all their questions. So um, we'll call it a night. And again, I want to thank you for being our presenter, for sure. You were wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, to to our audience, I almost said my audience, but I guess I have to share you. Uh, <laughs> to our <laughs> audience, thank you so much for uh, hanging out with us again for another hour or so on a Thursday night. Um, we're still on the every other week schedule and will be throughout the fall. So our next talk is actually in two weeks. So we hope that you visit our website at lumcon.edu forward slash science dash talks forward slash um, to find out who the next speaker is because you know it's escaping my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'll have the registration link for that talk up as soon as I get the talk information. Um, but I will have a link for the recording of this talk um, tomorrow afternoon. So um, if you're interested in sharing the talk with friends and family, um, that will be available tomorrow. With that, I wish everybody a healthy and safe Labor Day weekend. Um, take care of yourself and each other, please. And I will see you next time. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Go enjoy <laughs> those kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye.